And we're back. So, today, we are, we're continuing on with the Abolition for the People series of essays by Kaepernick Publishing. Uh, this one is going to be the 14th out of 30 in the series. But I'm going to start it by giving some background, because the format of this essay is a... Um, a it's a discussion, uh, kind of. So... I want to give some background on who Russell Schultz is first, so that we know who we're talking about and the depths of what they have suffered in their interactions with the justice system. So, first just right off the top. Russell Schultz is a former Black Panther. As we've discussed, the Black Panthers suffer have suffered extreme amounts of um, excessive force upon them, including the formation of SWAT and the utilization of a massive force deployed against a Black Party or a Black Panther Party headquarters, where 5,000 live rounds were fired, and where several women and children were, you know, killed or injured in the process. Um, not for, you know, not because it was any sort of imminent threat, just because it was uh, considered a politically inconvenient group. So. Starting with this side essay from 2016. After 33 years in solitary confinement, former Black Panther Russell Schultz will have his day in court. This is from 2016. Um, he has actually been released from solitary, but still is uh, yeah. let's see. Russell Maroon Schultz, a former Black Panther who escaped from Pennsylvania prisons twice in the 1970s, was held in solitary confinement for nearly 33 years, including 22 consecutive years, from 1991 to 2014. During that time, Schultz was in, uh, confined to his cell in complete social isolation for 23 to 24 hours a day. He contends that his time in solitary has led him to develop severe mental health issues, including chronic depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and more, and that the length of time he was held in isolation was based, at least in part, on his political ba beliefs. But as of last month, Schultz is one step closer to a potential legal remedy for his decades in solitary confinement. Um, right off the bat, just... Solitary confinement is even acknowledged as like a form of torture by international communities and such. Like this is, it's what you do when you want to completely break a person. There's nothing rehabilitative about it. There's nothing just about it. Since 2013, Schultz has been engaged in a legal suit against the Secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections and the Warden of State Correctional Institution at Green, SCI Green. The suit alleges that Schultz 
Eighth Amendment right to be protected from cruel and unusual punishment was violated by the extreme duration and conditions of his stay in solitary confinement, and that his 14th Amendment due process rights were violated by the prison's administrative review process, which shows his lawyers say made his release from solitary confinement back into the general prison population nearly impossible. On February 12th, federal judge Cynthia Reed Eddy ruled that the civil suit will go to trial in the U.S. District's Court in western Pennsylvania. The case had been up for a potential pretrial ruling known as summary judgment. Both Schultz and the defendants Wetzel and Felino had filed opposing motions for a summary judgment. In her denial of summary judgment, Judge Eddy wrote that while Schultz and the Department of Corrections are in agreement about Schultz's criminal history and the duration of his solitary confinement, beyond these facts the parties agree on little else. She also noted that Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court in Otto v. Finney has expressed concern about the possible unconstitutionality of solitary confinement, depending on the duration of the confinement and the conditions thereof. Schultz's case is not a class action suit, so any eventual trial decision will only apply to him. However, the precedent that the case will set could have wide reverberations for the eight 80 to 100,000 Americans who are still held in solitary confinement, many for long periods of time, and most without the benefit of the type of diligent legal counsel that Schultz has recently had. Schultz's case has avoided a pretrial dismissal on the grounds of technicalities, unlike thousands of other similar cases brought forth without representation. Such dismissals have been extremely common since the passing of the 1997 or 1995 Prison Litigation Reform Act, which makes it extreme. Bye. Which makes it extremely difficult for imprisoned people to sue the government. Yep, trolls happen. One of Schultz's lawyers, Brett Grote of the Abolitionist Law Center, was unsurprised that Judge Eddy chose not to give a final ruling without allowing the case to go to trial. I'm not surprised she denied our motion. For summary judgment, he said, she would have been getting farther ahead than any of the other federal courts in ruling what is excessive solitary confinement without fact-finding during a trial. Brett further noted that Two of three similar cases challenging the duration of solitary confinement in recent years have been found to have sufficient cause to go to trial. Grote cited the summary judgment of the Angola 3 case as a seminal opinion that laid out a road roadmap for Schultz's case. Before we go on, I just I, I have to stick with that the idea of solitary confinement again, like... It is cruel and unusual punishment. It is not a... It will not cause any sort of reform. It is not a deterrent. It is just a form of psychological torture. Um, many people even through COVID, have been describing the great amounts of anxiety that they have felt, even while technically being able to contact each other on the phone, on the internet, be able to visit neighbors or, you know, family or what have you. Now, imagine being in a box where your only interaction with anyone is someone who gives you food once a day and that's on a good day. For 33 years. That's nearly as long as I've been alive.
Like, what is the lesson supposed to be in that? You, you... I mean, the lesson is just, please die, but... But it's, it is a very, it's not an actual form of justice, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Anyway, continuing on. Schultz has been in prison since 1972, when he was found guilty of a first-degree murder that was part of a 1970 Black Liber Liberation Army attack on a Philadelphia police station, which resulted in the death of one officer and the injury of another. I will remind... That in 1969, one year prior, there was, again, a massive, disproportionate assault, all-out assault, slaughter at the Black, Party, uh, Black Panther Party headquarters by the newly formed SWAT. I'm not saying that, you know, violence necessarily justifies violence, but... When the law is out to just execute you, one cannot be surprised that someone retaliates. In 1977, Schultz and several other prisoners overtook a cell block, injuring several guards with a knife and escaped from prison. While he was on the run, he went to the home of a prison guard and eventually forced the guard, his wife, and child into the woods, where he left them tied to a tree for several hours. Back in prison after his reapprehension, Schultz was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and depressive disorder and transferred to Fairview State Hospital for the criminally insane. In 1980, he was able to briefly pull off an escape from Fairview. When he was caught and put back in prison, he began the first of his many long stints in solitary confinement. Schutt served two years in solitary confinement from 1980 to 1982 until a hunger strike that he and others in solitary confinement had organized resulted in their release back into the general prison population. However, his time outside of solitary was short-lived. Back with the general prison population, Schutz began peacefully organizing with the Pennsylvania Association of Lifers, attempting to get family members of imprisoned people to lobby their state legislature to repeal life without parole sentencing. One day in early 1983, Schutz was named interim president of the Lifers group and was placed in solitary confinement that night. Again, what is the actual message here? There's nothing... There's nothing illegal about organizing like that. There's nothing illegal about asking family members to put political pressure on their state legislatures. A lot of people out there crying about censorship because they get their account deleted or whatever on Twitter. This, this is an example of actual censorship. This is what censorship looks like. Save for a 19 month period from 1989 to 1991, Schultz was kept in solitary confinement from that night, in 1983, until 2014. While in solitary, Schultz was kept in a 7x12 foot cell in the restricted housing unit, an uh, unofficial euphemism. Uh, for the block of cells used for solitary confinement. Rubber strips surrounded and the sides and bottom of the cell door, effectively making the cell a sensory deprivation center or chamber. 
The light of this cell remained on 24 hours a day, a practice that Dr. James Gilligan, a psychiat uh, psychiatrist serving as an expert witness before the court, called a well-known method of torture. In his declaration to the court. Yeah. Because it is. Prisoners in the RHU were prevented from talking to each other, increasing the extreme social isolation beyond that which is inherent in physical isolation. Schoetz was only allowed out of his cell for one hour a day, five days a week, to exercise in a cage not significantly larger than a cell. This limited recreation time required uh, this limited recreation time required an intrusive strip search which made Schultz anxious and caused him to rarely leave his cell during the small window of time he was afforded to do so. He was also moved to a different cell every 30 to 90 days. Schultz wrote in his declaration for the court that this increased my anxiety because I could never settle into one place. Nobody ever told me why I was being moved. I also had heightened anxiety because I was corner, uh, concerned that my property would be taken during cell transfers, since it was searched upon leaving one cell as well as when entering the next. And periodically items such as approved reading materials and my own writings would be confiscated during cell transfers. Through the 22 consecutive years of solitary, Schutz's mental health deteriorated tremendously, according to evidence presented in the lawsuit. Dr. Gilligan concluded that years of extreme isolation and the specific conditions of his time in solitary confinement led to a menagerie of mental health problems. Schutz's mental health issues have continued to persist since his release back into general prison population and include chronic depression, despair, intermittent suicidal ideation, problems concentrating, short-term memory loss, and insomnia. During the last six years he was in solitary confinement, he could not sleep for more than four hours a night. Despite his apparently deteriorating mental health, entire decades passed without the prison giving Schultz a mental health evaluation. The extreme isolation, Schultz claims, also left him emotionally numb and unable to form intimate relationships. Though he is no longer confined to his cell, he rarely leaves unless he is required to do so. Speaking during his evaluation about his time in solitary, Schultz told Dr. Gilligan, I was infantilized for so long I had to deal with very few people. I developed no skills as to how to be in a relationship. I felt relief from ending my relationship with his former fiance. Nothing painful, I just don't care. It's a mental state that's impossible to relate to. Um, and I am ashamed that and, and angry that it is allowed to occur here. This is like this is barbarism. This is just I mean it's torture. It, it is the psychological version of, of like boiling one's feet. Um, sorry. In 2004, the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections created the Restricted Release List, which kept those with RRL status in solitary indefinitely. The list also prevented anyone placed on the list from being released from solitary confinement in the RHU without the DOC Department of Corrections Secretary's approval. 
for the secretary to consider this approval, the prison's warden had to recommend him for release. A grievance committee heard from Schultz every one to three months, but they only had the ability to make minor changes like providing an extra blanket to the prisoner. Neither the committee nor anyone else ever provided Schultz with a rationale for his continued solitary confinement in RHU. Schultz's lawyers called the review system seriously Kafkaesque. There is no committee here. There is no actual expert panel. There is no jury involved in this. It is just at the discretion of two individuals, the warden and the secretary, and their word is absolute. So. That seems kind of problematic, if you ask me. Like... Maybe some kind of court should be involved here, or... It shouldn't be happening at all. Like, this is just... this shouldn't... This should not be a valid... Uh, this should not be part of the prison system. Still, each time he met with the committee, Schultz asked to be released from solitary confinement. Despite being made aware of Schultz's condition, including meeting with Schultz's daughter in 2012, Secretary Wetzel never reviewed Schultz's RRL status from 2004 until his release from solitary in 2014. In a document provided to the court, a 2012 CS, uh, C, SCI Green Staff document admitted that at 68 years old, Schultz himself was not a serious escape risk, but argued that his history of political organizing poses substantial risk to the staff and the security of our institution. So if you are a black man, political organizing being involved in and having the skills to be a political organizer is de facto criminal despite being a First Amendment right that should be afforded to all persons. But here, on paper, our justice system decided to remove this individual from the, the general prison populace solely based on his history of political organizing. Again, this is what actual censorship looks like. None of this, my Facebook disinformation post was deleted, wah. No, fucking 33 years in solitary because you talk politics with people. That is censorship. That is inhumane. That is North Korean shit. But it happens here. As recently as 2014. It's still going on today. We have thousands of people. It said 80 to 100,000 in solitary. Standard international rules for the treatment of prisoners have been in place since the 1950s, but that the UN clarified them last year, laying out what are now called the Nelson Mandela Rules. Uh, Juan Mendez, the UN Special Rapporteur uh, on Torture, who also provided expert witness Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, who also provided extra w expert witness in Schutz's suit. Old solitary watch that, under international and U.S. law, that more than 15 days in solitary would constitute cruel and unusual punishment. 
but that the duration of Schutz's stay in solitary violates international law and is definitely torture. Amy Fettig, senior staff counsel at the ACLU's National Prison Project and the director of the Stop Solitary Campaign, placed the developments of, in Schutz's case within a growing trend of resistance to the widespread use of solitary confinement. What we're say, seeing right now from the public, from corrections itself, and from the judiciary is a recognition that solitary confinement is overused and abused in this country. There's a growing consensus that we need to do some, be doing something different. The open question is what? Asked about the Schultz case, the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections responded, we declined to comment on ongoing litigations. Um, yeah, I don't know what, uh, what you're going for there. Modest. Anyway, that is the case of Russell, Russell Schultz. And, uh, I wanted to give that background before we moved into the essay, because the essay is specifically about his case. I'm not sure who you're talking to, Modest. <laughs> um, but I do ask to engage onto the topic at hand, or, you know, or check into a different stream. <laughs> Okay, so with that said, we'll transition over to actually reading this. I mean, if you're going to be that way, then I'm just going to show you the door. Take care. Anyway, weird night. Hey, Mona. So, with that background, a Black Panther held in solitary confinement for 33 years based on by the Department of Corrections' own admission his fear of their fear of him as a political organizer we're going to be reading this. <laughs> Mona, yeah. I gave him two choices. Engage with the discussion or find a different channel. Like, this is a discussion. This is a structured discussion. We have a topic at hand. Don't need to be chasing whatever he was running after. I, you know, maybe he had some good points. I don't know, but he wasn't. I wasn't asking him to leave, I was asking him to engage on the subject, but anyway. <laughs> he made it clear he was not interested in doing that, so I'm not interested in him as an audience member. This one's going to be hard for, um, oh god, I hate this. I hate this. <laughs> I just, I have to say that up front. <coughs> it's important. It's important reading. But, uh, I know it's in here, so I just, I, I am. Anyway.
So this was mostly... This is mostly by Russell's son, because what that article that we just went over left out is, you know, Russell's not a completely isolated individual. He, <laughs> uh, he's a human being. He has family. So this is... Contains some from Russell um, and some from Russell the Third. Son's fight for his father's freedom. Russell Schultz and Russell Schultz the Third share how they built an unshakable relationship in spite of incarceration and separation. Russell Maroon Schultz is an activist, writer, founding member of the Black Unity Council, former member of the Black Panther Party, and soldier in the Black Liberation Army. Incarcerated in 1972 and now 77 years old, Maroon is serving multiple life sentences, sentences in Pennsylvania as a U.S.-held political prisoner of war. After escaping prison twice in 1977 and 1980, he earned the name Maroon from fellow incarcerated men, a nod to Africans who fled chattel slavery and created autonomous communities throughout the Americas. His son, Russell Schultz III, is a longtime activist, educator, and live event producer. For the past three decades, he's worked tirelessly for his father's freedom and that, that of all U.S.-held political prisoners. Below, Maroon and Russell discuss their life together while being kept apart the traumas they've suffered at the hands of the carceral state, and how, in spite of all this, they still have an unbreakable relationship as educators, as freedom fighters, and as father and son. Conversation has been edited and condensed for clarity. This is Maroon speaking. Um, from as far back as I can remember, my son has intrigued me with his analysis on a multitude of different subjects. I guess it should come as no surprise since the Schultz family is steeped in a long tradition of education and profound thinkers. Russell. Some of my earliest memories are of attending Samuel B. Huey Elementary School in on 52nd and Pine in West Pen uh, Philadelphia. My mother worked at the school. Maroon. My mother. Gladys Schultz was a trailblazer in supporting her community and her neighbors' families in Philadelphia. She made sure that the educational systems worked for her community and that the people knew exactly what they were supposed to receive from the school board. My now deceased sister, Ida Schultz, also became an educational icon in Philadelphia and abroad. In Peru, she helped organize school lunch programs for over a dozen villages in the Andes. When she returned home, Ida channeled her experiences back into her own community, challenging the educational system to properly serve poor and disenfranchised communities in ways few, if any, African-American women had before. My other sister, Dr. Suzette Hakim, also became a lifelong education advocate and supported countless students of all ages. I didn't, but that's not on, that's not up for discussion at the moment. Wait until open discussion, thanks. So over 40 years ago, when my son Russell began to ask me about a myriad of topics, my criminal case and why I was incarcerated, my spiritual beliefs, my cultural beliefs, what books I was reading, my relationships with women, I immediately knew we would be engaged in a lifelong or lifetime educational journey. Russell. For my formative years, until I was a preteen, my mother was extremely diligent in shielding me from any harm or danger, and specifically in making sure that any of the political actions that my father was involved in from the turbulent 60s didn't affect my growth, development, and abilities to prosper in general. In elementary school, though, I first began to recognize that I was a little different than most children around me. My good friend, Reginald Barnes, 
whose father was a police officer and a pastor, would occasionally invite me over to do homework. Mr. Barnes told me that every time I came over to study with Reggie, he would bring us pizza. I was more than obliged to take him up on the offer. Shortly after, my father escaped from prison for the first time. It was a surreal experience, especially in the context of Philadelphia in the 70s, widely experienced by black and disenfranchised communities as a police state. Frank Rizzo was the police chief, and police terror reigned. That day started off as usual, but just as first period was beginning, we were all alerted by the sound of a three-tone xylophone over the public announcement system. Usually the xylophone would be followed by a fire drill or some other school-specific message. This time it was considerably different as the principal began delivering what can only be described as a student's dream. He stated that there would be an early dismissal that day. The entire school, myself included, erupted in joy at the proclamation. That joy would soon turn into bewilderment. As my classmates and I exited the building, we discovered that our school was surrounded by Rizzo's police force, armed to the teeth. A teacher walked me across the street to my home, but it wasn't the home that I had known. My home was filled with intruders. The intruders were police officers, police officers who I immediately saw as a threat. I witnessed my mother intensely arguing with them. I watched those intruders set about destroying Everything in the house, from furniture to framed family photos. They claimed that they were looking for my father. From that day on, school at Samuel B. Huey would never be the same. Non-stop classmates would ask me how my father got on TV. Regularly. Regularly, some of my ch childhood friends would bring up that my father was on the front page of the newspaper. What stays with me the most, though, is classmates casually saying, Tell your father to escape again so that we can have another early dismissal. I was only ten years old. I was ten, trying to navigate anger and sorrow at my father's absence. I was ten trying to make sense of the little information I'd overheard from family members about my father taking up arms to defend our community against police violence. I was 10, dealing with flashbacks of law enforcement forcing their way into my home, claiming to be looking for my father. Yet, to some of my peers, all that mattered about him was the possibility of getting another day off of school. Maroon. <laughs> Like most people, Russell wanted to know the in-depth specifics of how I ended up with a life sentence without parole, and all the gritty details surrounding my involvement with the Black Unity Council and, later, the Black Liberation Army. I explained to him, as I've been explaining to people until now, that those details, if exposed, would incriminate me and others. He recognized early on that phone calls and letters would limit him in the information for which he was mining. This led to relentless visitations and many hours of travel. I was always considered an escape risk, but I remained in solitary confinement for nearly 30 years, 22 of them consecutive. At Dallas, Pennsylvania, they forced my family to unsafely travel through the entire prison in order to visit me in my dark, dank basement cell as if I were Hannibal Lecter. At one point, my son even traveled to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where I was illegally transported following the Camp Hill Prison Uprising of 1989, in which incarcerated people in Pennsylvania rose up against overcrowding and inhumane conditions. After days of skullduggery, <clears throat> skullduggery mental jousting, intense questioning, and eating all of the vending machine food, including my favorites, coffee and cake, Russell sat quietly in that Kansas prison, staring downward, and he raised his head to ask a question that took me totally by surprise. He said that based on the bulge in my pants, it seemed that he was not endowed with the same size penis as me. I chuckled and explained to him that the bulge came from repeated beatings, where my attackers would all kick me in the groin until I was completely disfigured.
still thirsting for more, you would ingeniously pry information from me and intensely debate me. Historically, these con Russell. Historically, these conversations with my father have been like mentally battling one of the greatest mixed martial arts fighters of all time. Gracie Jiu Jitsu has been uh, has nothing on the mental warfare I've endured and the ingenious ways by which the crafty old veteran has forced me to tap out. Maroon. I was never bothered by his mental attacks, as this was common amongst the younger men in prison who, after failed physical attacks, would result to the intellectual bum rush. I welcomed these opportunities and created African-centered solitary confinement study courses. As the hardened young men would be sent to the hole, my comrades and I would immediately engage them about why they were in prison and stress how important it was that they educate themselves before leaving. It was literally a mental boot camp in which I shared my personal library of books that family and supporters would send me. The young students were engaged, encouraged, and tested on what they had read until we felt that they had properly retained the information. Similar to the ongoing mental battles I endured with my son, these young men became some of my greatest teachers. A recent debate I had with Russell focused on Marvel's movie Black Panther and the character Killmonger. I proposed that someone had done some intense research of our movement in the 60s, including the Black Panther Party and Black Liberation Army, and had synthesized our rage and anger into this uncoincidentally Oakland-reared character. Russell. I had to agree that, due to the Hollywood budget and cultural context of the Marvel movie, there seemed to be to, to have been some significant research of movements and strategies by our most recent freedom fighters. But I've challenged some of these, some of my father's analysis of the film, in particular his overarching critique of Killmonger. Maroon. I believe he's an example of how militants can be blinded by the thoughts of physical and military conquest as retribution, this blind rage as a gateway to a host of schisms, from misogyny to power hoarding to an overall loss of focus on what Che Guevara famously stated as the reason why we fight, a love for the people. Russell. Most people that I've engaged with, be they activists, academics, or everyday folks in my world, love Killmonger for his desire to fight the oppressor and channel his anger, even if some in the village didn't understand his tactics. Personally, I'm a fan as well, though I do have my share of questions surrounding the portrayal of some not-so-glamorous details about his past, namely his father's dirty dealings with the mercenary and the sweeping trauma that defines his childhood as a result of his father's brutal death. Hollywood continues to give credence to the stereotype of black men not being present in crucial ways and not being able to overcome particular challenges. It's not lost on me that I'm calling this convention to task as a black man whose own father was locked up or on the run since I was three years old. But lurking beneath all the great fight scenes and the mach mach machismo and bravado that Killmonger embodies in it is his dysfunctional childhood which feeds his blind rage. This narrative of the traumatized black male child whose only outlet is self-destruction, which in most cases leaks out onto his very own community, is well-worn and cliche. Think about how this storytelling technique shows up consistently throughout Hollywood depictions of black communities. I'm not knocking Black Panther as a whole. There's plenty to admire in its script, enactment, and production. But while I support the broadening representation of black folks in Hollywood and our ability to shape our own narratives and tell our own story, stories, the critic in me can't help but point out these striking contradictions. What good is increased access to large-scale cultural production if we're reproducing outdated tropes anchored in pathologizing blackness? I suppose then my critique of how Killmonger's childhood is represented in the film ultimately overlaps with some of my father's concerns about the character as an adult. Some years ago, my father encouraged my sisters and me to take on African names. He urged us all to do it as a reclamation of cultural heritage erased by our upbringing and socialization. 
in the US. I picked Jella, which in Swahili means father was troubled around the time of my birth. Bill Monger's past also involves his father facing trial and tribulation rooted in the, a commitment to liberating black people when he was young. That stereotype reminds me of one of the characters in The Wire. Yeah, it's um, a very common stereotype. Unlike the Hollywood caricatures, though, I've spent 40 years learning from my father's struggles. We don't even see eye to eye on all topics related to our people's fight for liberation. When it comes to character, courage, commitment, and critical thinking, I must admit that those disgruntled teachers, authority figures, and police officers from my youth were spot on. I have proudly ended up just being just like my father, and my father deserves to be free. It is 2020. My father was born in 1943. He's 77 years old. He's a grandfather. He's an elder suffering from stage 4 colorectal cancer. He's a threat to no one. He's a prisoner of a war waged against black people by the US government. The only threat that he serves is to anyone who believes that black people are unworthy of defending themselves against state-sanctioned acts of terror. He is a human being who has been dehumanized, confined in a cage, alone, and tortured. My father deserves to be free. All political prisoners deserve to be free. Free them all. reason that I felt it was important to preface this essay with the other one was because this essay gets much more into the human element and their interactions with each other which is is absolutely beautiful and vital but it doesn't it rightly doesn't get into the actual details of the injustice that he has faced. I imagine they don't talk about that that much because they don't need to talk about it. It's part of their experience. They've lived it for most of Russell's life. So I really wanted to emphasize um, the the struggles and the absolute failure of the justice system um, in this case, and get into and provide those details before getting into this human element and exploring their relationship that they have blessedly managed to develop despite all efforts by the state to simply erase this person from existence. And that is what the state is trying to do. By their own admission, because they fear him as a political organizer. And it can't be allowed to stand. I mean... A lot of the essays that we cover, most of them, are speaking more broadly to the systemic problems and talking statistics. Occasionally, we need an individual case, a microcosm, that clearly illustrates the problem and clearly illustrate, illustrates the case for abolition. And this is absolutely one of those cases. A system where the punishment is absolutely just way beyond the pale. 
of anything deserved. And where the review system of that punishment is designed to not actually allow any review. Eighty to a hundred thousand other people in solitary confinement. Many, many are political prisoners. Our sentencing is not solely based on crime. Our sentencing is also based on suppressing political ideation that challenges injustices in our current system. And that is leveled at people who are marginalized, who live it and who know it the best. I would be interested in seeing that uh, the breakdown of how often solitary is used along racial lines, and I'm I haven't seen the data, but I can imagine what it looks like. And I can imagine that it is not based on, you know, behaviors um, being any different. Anyway. Any closing thoughts on this one before we conclude the discussion for the night? Yeah, that's the goal. That is the goal. <laughs> Poor Finny. Uh, all right, well, 